If you were to uh, get in your car, drive on down to, to downtown Cincinnati, and just like with all your strength, pull up one of those manholes and go on in the sewer system, like get on in the catacombs of, of downtown Cincinnati and wander on through there. Anyone, anyone do that? Okay, we got one weird guy. Okay, you know, one, okay, two, maybe like a fireman or something. You would, you would see some pretty incredible things. And I think you would grow in your appreciation for Cincinnati. Because oftentimes when you're going down there to shop or eat or work or whatever, you just see these massive buildings, right? Big skyscrapers that are all lit up and are beautiful, made out of granite or concrete. But if you were going to go down underneath the city, you would see the inner workings of all these really tall buildings. You'd see gas lines, you'd see power lines. If you like wandered down there with a flashlight, you'd look up and go, oh, that's how that massive building gets heat to it. Oh, that's, that's how all the electricity flows in there. And without, without all those gas lines, power lines, electric stuff, those big old tall buildings would be just shells. It'd, be, it'd sit there cold, dark, Empty, right? Not a whole lot of life in them. And so too, in the same way, our, our lives are just like that. The Bible speaks of the heart being the very life, the blood, the, like the very breath, the flow of all that is in us. Uh, I just want to read a few heart verses from the Scriptures that, that talks about the importance of the life within us. 1 Samuel 16.7 says this, Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Psalm 51.17, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O God, You will not despise. Here's 2 Chronicles 16.9. If you're visiting with us, this is the book we've been living in for a while. It says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth. Watch this. Giving strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards Him. And the last one, this is one of my favorites, is Proverbs 4.23. Keep your heart. Or some translations say, guard your heart with all vigilance. For from it flows the springs of life. Isn't that good? All this, all this heart talk, right? Is this some like Disney thing that we like come together and talk about like warm fuzzies of our heart? Like is this, is this a, re- a reality in Scripture? Like what, what does it mean to love God with all your heart? For it to, to give light and heat to your very life. Because you can't always see it. You can't always grab it. You don't always know how to describe it or, or talk about it. Uh, one tribe in East Africa, the Maasai tribe, um, if you were to say, hey, have you ever, um, have you ever received Christ? Have you ever uh, asked Him in your heart? They'd be like, what? What are you talking about? And the, the believers there in the Maasai tribe talk about receiving Christ in their tumbo, their stomach, right? This Maasai tribe, they, they look after large herds of, of cattle and, and their whole life is centered around their stomach. Like, like they, they take care of the cows because that's what they eat. And they, they, like, they go in and out of their huts and they... they you know, boil milk and have chai with their families and things. Everything is like surrounded and everything that they do is, is because of their tumbo, their stomach. And so, of course, when it came time to like translating the scriptures in Swahili and in their key Maasai language, it was, well, the stomach is like the very center of life. And if I'm going to give the Lord my, my everything, I'm, I might as well give him my stomach. And receive him there because he will affect everything. This is the heart. This is how we talk about things when it comes to the spiritual life. How when 
we give the Lord our hearts, when we love Him, it affects everything. And so if you're taking notes this morning, the title of our sermon today is A Heart for God. A Heart for God. And there's two major points. God's heart and your heart. We're going to study this thing called the heart. And hopefully by the end of our time today, uh, you'll love him more with all that you are. And you'll learn about what he is about. Amen? So let's start with point number one. God's heart. All right, so what is on God's heart? We've been studying 2 Chronicles for a while. We've talked about the humble heart, the repentant heart, the turning heart, like the the heart that prays, things like that. But we haven't asked yet, what is God's heart like? Like, what is He about? what's, What's on His heart? What are His passions? What are His ambitions and goals? I'm going to say two statements about God's heart. So here's the first one. This is kind of a big statement. It might rattle you a little bit, but we're going to be all right. We're going to get through it, okay? All ready? God's heart is for himself. God loves himself. There's two passages of Scripture. There's many passages in the Bible that talk about this. But here's two that I just want to bring up this morning. Exodus 34, 14, it says, For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. And then Isaiah 42, watch this one. 42, 8, I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. Those two things, like being jealous or saying like, I will not share my glory. Those aren't like, those aren't common phrases in the home, right? Like when your kids are going out and they're like grabbing their book, their backpacks and they got all their books in their hand and their lunch and you're like, hey Johnny, just remember, be a jealous little kid, right? Like you don't say that or like, hey, remember Margaret, like, Don't share your glory with another at school. Like, be seeking after it. Like, you don't say that. Why? I mean, just a plain speech. It's not okay. It's not okay for us humans to do that or say that. It is okay for God. Like, God, because He's worth it, because He's pure, holy, righteous, just, Because he is God, he can do that. It's okay for him. It's okay for God to be a glory hound. And it's not prideful. It's not boastful. It's not wrong. Because he's worth it. Amen, church? This is our Lord. So the first statement we're saying about what is on God's heart, we're saying is, well, God's heart is for himself. The second statement about God's heart is this. Uh, what's on God's heart? And I think you'll like this one. This, this feels more palatable to you because it's taught, preached, studied more often. But God's heart, and this is true, is for you. Isn't that a wonderful truth? Like God's heart. He is not this God who sits up on high and cares nothing about humanity. He really does love you. Like this should this should permeate your thinking and affect your heart. Like God loves you so much. I don't know if anyone has told you that this week, but he does. This is not just a simple truth. This is profound. God, because he is God, he created you and he loves you. He wanted himself to be worshiped. And so he created mankind and said, you know what? I love the world. And I love it so much that John 3.16, I'm going to send my son. And whoever believes in me shall not perish, shall not die, but will have eternal life. It's awesome. This is the truth about God. He is a God of love. Okay? But there is a problem. And that man has sinned. 
Man has fallen short of his glory. Man like, is separated from God. He can't have fellowship with God because of this dark stain on his heart that comes from birth. Theologians call it original sin. It means like that all of us are in the same boat unless some of you were born of a virgin. Which the last time I checked, we were all born of a father and a mother. <laughs> Our parents were Adam and Eve. And we received, because we deserved it, sin. And because we were born, we deserve death. Not just because we have sinned, not just because we committed an act, not just because when we were young we lied or we took a cookie from the cookie jar. It's because we are intrinsically like warped, bent, fallen, and in total and utter need of Jesus. So the bad news of the good news is that we're sinners. Romans just is, is such a good book to go and, 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 and read through and, and memorize at least portions of it. You know, it's pretty tough. It's pretty long. And it says, for the wages of sin is death. But there's more to that verse and there's more to the gospel. And the gospel also says this, that Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. Amen? Amen. So like there's good news, right? Bad news, ah, oh, we blew it as mankind. But God loves us so much that He provided a way. Singular, like specific, narrow. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. This means that our gospel is very exclusive. It's not a tolerant one. There's only one way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, friends, it is not enough like, to just ascribe to those as, as a series or a set of facts. To be like, oh, cool, yeah, I, um, I believe in that just like I believe uh, that 2 plus 2 is 4. That's basically a truism, and, and that's true, but like, uh, I can like, accept that as a truth that exists out there in general. The Bible like, is specific, and God is clear so much so to say that you must respond to this truth. It's not, it doesn't exist out in the clouds. It's for you. You must repent of your sin and place your faith and trust in Jesus in order to receive this good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a very significant and exclusive statement this means that not everyone is saved. This would be the gospel of universalism. That we are all going to heaven. It is true that there is a heaven, there is a hell, and some go to heaven, and some go to hell. And those who go to heaven are the ones who place their faith and trust in Jesus. This is a beautiful thing. Amen? This is how it works. This is like the relationship between God and mankind. He is ferociously after your heart. Creates mankind and He wants mankind to worship Him. He's on this like glory train and He won't stop until He has all your heart. That's what He does. He wants it all for Himself. Not just some of it. He wants it all. And that's okay. Because He's God. God gets glory through saving people through Jesus that they would live for His glory. This is how God's heart works. And this is my story as well. And so just to take a brief pause and let you know that this is not some theological truth that I don't believe or that I've never been affected by this is how the Lord has worked in my heart. 
Um, many of you know that I came to Christ at a young age, and uh, many of you know that I'm not a perfect person. <laughs> and when I came to Christ, I didn't come to perfection. I came to a person. It was Jesus. And he progressively began to grow me more into his image. One of the main things that he did in my life growing up um, uh, was this story that I'm about to tell, okay? So uh, I remember when I was little, I was walking through the halls of my high school, and I looked up on the wall, and in our high school, uh, we kept this wall of fame. And it was all the athletes in our high school that made uh, all state, okay? And I remember at a young age looking up at that wall and going, I want to be there one day. I want my picture to be on that wall. It was like this decision that happened in my heart. What was my heart saying? This is me just trying to reveal the darkness within and my growth process in following Jesus, okay? This week I was, I was trying to, Lord, what, what was it that I was after in my early years? And I think that this was it. Glory. Like that's, that was my heart's cry. That was like my ambition. Like I wanted to be remembered. Like I wanted my name, my picture, my renown on the walls of my high school so that throughout the years, people walking back and forth would look up upon that wall and go, oh, there's Mike, the greatest basketball player that ever passed through these halls. What? A man, right? That's, I mean, that's what I wanted. I wanted that for my name to be echoed throughout my hometown. And for me, the path that made most sense to get that picture up on the wall was for me to make varsity as a freshman. It had never been done in my hometown. And so at a young age, I was like, I am doing it. I'm going to be the best basketball player that I can. And so like every day, I worked on my basketball skills. It was my glory. It was my crown. It was my idol. I wanted it. Because deep in my heart, I wanted the glory. So I worked at it, worked at it, worked at it. And guess what? Freshman year, I made varsity. And I start, my, my, my neck started to hurt, actually, my freshman year, proverbially, because my head started to grow so big. Kids, what that means, that's not a, a, a literal thing. Some of my children are literalists, so I have to, like, when I speak proverbially, I have to, that means my heart was prideful. When you say your head's big, that means that in your heart, you think you're better than what you really are. So I, like, couldn't even walk through door frames, right? <laughs> it was like an orange on a toothpick, right? <laughs> But I didn't talk like that. I didn't walk like that. I didn't like, people didn't know what was going on in my heart, but that's what was going on in my heart. And around that same time, guess what else happened? Not proverbially, but my neck started hurting physically. See, I was a football player as well, and I just, I, I tackled this guy named Russ Diamond, and something got like messed up in my neck and shoulder. And it just, I, I remember that hit on the, on the practice field and remembering like, oh, it's a stinger, it's a kink, but like, this is what you do. You don't tell anyone because you're a dude, you're masculine, but like, ow, my shoulder really hurts. I went and saw a chiropractor, went and saw a physical therapist afterwards, and they're like, oh yeah, let's just do some shoulder exercises and we'll get you, you know, we'll get you good in a couple weeks or whatever. And four years later, I was still doing shoulder therapy doing my bands every night, doing my weights, and it wasn't getting any better. It was getting progressively worse. And it, it, it began like to be really difficult to raise my arms. You ever tried shooting a ball when you can't really raise your arms? It's hard. It's really difficult. You ever tried guarding someone on defense without your arms? And so progressively throughout my high school years, even though my, my heart, my head, everything was set on sights to being the best basketball player I could, 
the Lord was working on my heart by way of my injured neck. Because when I did that hit at an early age, I experienced a herniated disc in my neck. It began to infringe on my nerve lines, and I was tingly every day in my right arm. He was working on my heart. And the turning point for me in my growth in Christ was when I started not to care about my name and my glory. And it was a battle for my heart. But the Lord loved me so much that he pursued me ruthlessly so that my heart would be wholly his. I remember uh, newspapers uh, that were printed Saturday morning and picking them up and seeing my face on it and getting so excited and then seeing like the title, Anderson scores 20 points for the Jaguars and going, my name is not Anderson. And reading the scores and going, you know, Artel scores 27 for the Jaguars for the victory and going, those were my 27 points. And again and again, until awards night, I realized what the Lord was doing. My heart was so hard. My head was thick. Biblically, I was stiff-necked. Until awards night, my senior year, the coach he had all these notes written up, ready to say the name and renown of Mike Newman to, the, to all the players and to all the parents. And the awards night ended. We closed it out. He looked at his notes and he forgot to say my name. And I remember at that point going, that's what you're doing in my life, Lord. You don't want to raise the name of Mike Newman. You want me to live for your name. And I remember at that awards, awards night, me being content that my name wasn't praised. And it set this trajectory of my life. Four years of neck pain, both proverbially and physically, to set a trajectory from my life to raise the name of Jesus. To not care if people remember my name. My life verse, um, if, you, if you like those kind of things, is uh, Isaiah 26, 8. It says, yes, Lord, we wait for you, for your name and renown are the desires of our hearts. And It wasn't always like that for me. It isn't always like that today. This is a continual process. But the Lord captured my heart. He worked on it. So there it is. There it is. There's that language of heart again. We're speaking about God's heart and, and, and the desires of our heart and how that works out. We're just going to continue to go just a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper. Like, what does that mean? Like when you say, my heart is for the Lord, what does that look like? Right? So of course, in, a, in the study of Second Chronicles and learning like the story in the, of the kings and the history of Israel and Judah, you have to study David. You have to like study about the guy that was called a man after God's own what? Okay? And so when we're asking the question, what does it mean to look, to have a heart for God, through the lens of David, we're going to talk now about our heart. And we're going to use the analogy of an EKG check, okay? A medical term, checking out the health of a heart. We're going to ask three questions. We'll call them just short EKG number one, two, and three. And that hopefully, by the end of this time, that our hearts will flourish. They'll be flowing with life for the Lord once again through the study of David. All right, so here we go. Here's my heart, EKG, number one. You ready for this checkup? It's a question, and it says this. Do you inquire of him? So as God is pursuing your heart and making your heart his, loving him more with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, 
The first question is, do you inquire of him? And since this is kind of like old school Newman sermon, you're hearing about my high school years, I remember in high school reading uh, the Old Testament. I played a lot of ball. I ate a lot of frozen pizzas. I do remember reading through First and Second Samuel, okay? And I remember being intrigued with this word throughout the text, inquire. It's used nine times to speak of how David relates of the Lord. And I do remember going, huh, that name, that verb is used a whole lot. Maybe I should try doing that, <laughs> right? Like that was my, how I thought uh, in high school as your pastor jock, right? And, uh, and so we're saying this morning that David, a man after God's own heart, a chief trait of his was that he inquired of the Lord. Uh, let me, you don't have to go there. Let me just read 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 8. Here's just one of the uses of the nine. And David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake, and surely shall I rescue you. Charles Spurgeon, uh, a preacher in England a while ago, says, the inquiry of God is the duty of all Christians. It's the duty of all Christians to inquire of him, right? This is the kind of heart that simply just says, hey, Lord, what do you think about this? Like, sh show me what you would have me do here in this circumstance. And if we were to just pause and think about a heart that inquires of God, I wonder what words would come to your mind. Maybe like, oh yeah, that's a humble dude right there. A guy who asks God, he's got to be humble, right? What's another word? I would say maybe prayerful. Surrendered. Willing. Maybe another one would be yielding. To ask the Lord, Lord, what do you think? And whatever you say, I'm, I'm willing to do it. We just sang about it. It's, the, it's, it's that concept of giving your life to the Lord and following Him. So inquiring of Him is a massive part of seeking Him. And this is one of the main reasons that David is called a man after God's own heart. Yeah, if you're taking notes, write down Acts 13, 22. It says, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and watch this, who will do all my will. All right, so simply put, David inquires of him. That was the reason. Let's just go one step deeper as we study what it means to be in a heart that inquires of him. Because we could just leave it like that. Like, all right, so guys, inquire of him this week, right? Like, just ask him stuff. But I think my heart in growing and helping develop and equipping you to walk with God, I think it would necessitate this question. So if you ask the Lord, with whatever's going on in your life, about like, hey Lord, what do you think and what I should do? what then? Right? Like, the question is, how do you listen to God? How does he speak to you? My wife and I, we just watched a, a movie, Unbroken, and, uh, and that famous um, Zemp Zemperini looks at one of his fellow soldiers and kind of laughs at him prior to coming to Christ and says, who are you praying to? And he's like, well, I'm praying to the Lord. A lot of people do this. And he's like, oh yeah, you hear anything? And then there's like some soldier chatter that I won't talk or use this morning, but like, that's what everyone wants to know. If I ask him, how do I hear from him? Okay? I'm just going to say two things this morning. One, um, his sheep know his voice. So number one, we're saying the Bible. He has spoken. 
And those who know and love Him, when they read the Scriptures, it is not foolishness to them. So those who love and know Him, they run to His Word and they read it. It doesn't mean that it always makes sense, but they want it and they cherish it and they dive into it. They want to know what it means. They inquire of the shepherd and the shepherd gives guidance. They lead Him. So number one is the Word. And then the second one is a little bit more subjective where it requires like community and, and, and time and things like that. But it's the Spirit. It's the Spirit leads you. The Spirit wrote the book, but the Spirit is in you who works and acts according to His good purposes, says Philippians. So what does that look like? Okay, so one quick example. Read through the book of Acts this week in your spare time, okay? Listen to it on your commute. You'll see this verb used all the time where God speaks to His people and they, they go like this. It seems right that we should go to Macedonia. And so they go. And you're like, what? What do you mean seems? And that's all we get from it. They like, when they're walking with God, they inquire of Him, and then He gives direction, and it seems right to do that. I remember in seminary asking my prof about this, Stanley Toussaint, like 82 years old at the time. Hey, prof, how do you make sense of of seems right? He said, well, I've been walking with the Lord for 55 years now. Early on, I really had to check myself a lot in the scriptures. I had to check myself with other people. But after walking with the Lord for 50 some years, I really know what is right and what is wrong. And I know what to do in, in circumstances. So I inquire of him, and then I do what seems right. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to have to study that one for a long time. But that's what it is. You follow him. Let's go to EKG check number two. So the first one was, hey, do you inquire of him? Here's the second one. Do you seek his mercy? Everyone knows the story of David. David was not a perfect king by any means. This is a big part of seeking God. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he was confronted, and he had one option. He had two options. Either I could not repent, or I could repent. And we get this picture of his repentance in Psalm 51. It's like a spiritual bath. Can I read it for you? Psalm 51 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. This is a big part of walking with the Lord. God tells us to seek Him by doing good stuff, like life-giving stuff. The Reformers and the Puritans would say things that, are, that provide vivification, that vivify your heart, that bring life. But also the other half of walking with God is dealing with your junk with God. Your sin. You should be comforted that as a church we're bold in this area. Like we're not just glossing over this. Like like sin doesn't exist and let's just like come to hear like niceties from the Scriptures. This is real. David was real. And even during the song... And during communion, I was confessing my sins of anxiousness. This is a beautiful process in the Christian life. Friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, church, take a spiritual bath this week. Like, get in the waters and be cleansed by confessing your sins. The EKG check number two is, do you seek mercy? Run to Him. If you're not right with the Lord, if you're not right with your kids, with your wife, with your spouse, whatever, seek mercy. Find forgiveness in Jesus. 
EKG check number three. This is the last one for the day. Do you seek to make him known? Another way to verbalize it would be, do you seek your fame or do you seek the Lord's fame in your life? Another way to just turn it on its edge is your heart for him or for just you. Right? Does, your, does your heart's cry and prayers say, Lord, your name and renown in this conversation, not mine. Lord, in this circumstance, in my job, in my school, whatever, Lord, your name and not mine. You can't preach a sermon on David unless you at least mention David and Goliath, like one of the most famous stories in the Bible. Everyone has like read the children's book versions but I thought it'd be refreshing to just read David's motive from the Bible when he was in front of Goliath. Why did he want to kill Goliath? What was on David's heart in that moment? Watch this. Ready? This is uh, up for you on the screen. 1 Samuel 17. And he like, read through this passage for your, with your own eyes. It's organized by, by speeches. Okay? And in one of his speeches, like one of his like heart's proclamations, he says this, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves not with sword or spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hand. That was David's heart. Not like, I'm going to kill this dude so it like, gets easier for our life and for our country. I'm going to kill this dude so I can be famous and so that, like, people can talk about me. No! My heart is for God's heart to be made known for His glory. Specifically, though, look at that. What was he saying? That all the earth may know. He was saying, God's heart is for the nations. I want what God wants I want everyone who doesn't know him to hear about him so that they would come to him through faith and repentance and worship him so that he would get the glory. It's like the same thing from the old to the new. Like people come to faith in Christ by faith and then their hearts are turned to him for his glory. Period. Amen? Second one. Watch how specific he is though. Verse 47. That all this would happen, that the assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with sword or spear. Assembly, that's old-fashioned word for like the ecclesia, the gathering. That's, where, that's how we got our church name. It's when people come together to give God glory. So he's saying like, hey, I'm praying that the people of God would know and be reminded how God saves that was his heart. That was David's heart. He was a heart that like pursued and sought after the Lord so that the glory of God would be raised. So this means in word and deed, church. So this week, like our calling as a church would be to follow him and to make him famous, to raise his glory to ask Him for a heart that would be consumed with His name, not our own, for His fame, not our own, for His renown, not our reputation. It's a good spiritual EKG check. Do you inquire of Him? Do you seek His mercy? Do you seek His fame in your life? Let's pray. Ask the Lord to do that in our own hearts. So that is our prayer, Lord. We're asking, would you work on our hearts? Lord, thank you that we don't always have to be there, but you help us get there. And when we fail, and when we drift, we're asking, would you bring us back? Lord, help us to be people that inquire of you. Help us to be prayerful people that seek your mercy. Lord, I pray that we would be a people that seek your fame not ours. Would you do this?